Hello, it's Scott Manley here and recently I made an appearance on NASA TV because we wanted to do an episode on how video games and NASA kind of cross over in places. So what we started out with was this recording I made of Elite Dangerous where I toured a number of locations, primarily within the solar system. At first, we started heading out towards the edge of the solar system, towards Pluto and Charon. These were, of course, the targets of the New Horizons spacecraft, which flew by them a couple of years ago. New Horizons later this year will fly by a Kuiper Belt object, but right now we wanted to get close to them in the game so we could see the same kind of views that New Horizons got when it was passing through. Well, okay, truthfully, as I've pointed out, New Horizons camera is more like a telescope that would focus on a very small part of the space of the planet. And uh, yeah, our eyes are a whole lot wider. But yeah, we have Charon, which is compared to the size of Pluto, it is essentially the largest body. So the, the ratio of mass between Pluto and Charon is closer to one than any other, you know, moon pair, moon planet pair in the solar system. But there is Pluto. It is still a planet. It is a dwarf planet right out on the edge of the solar system. Remember, its change of status from regular planet to dwarf planet was in part because of its size, but also because it was only 3 to 2 resonance with Neptune, and uh, there were several other substantial objects in this same resonance. But I'm looking at Charon because I have this fast Imperial Eagle. That's, of course, I'm flying a spaceship. I like to fly spaceships. And Charon has a whole bunch of chasmata, chasma, right? So these are chasms, they're valleys with steep edges, details that can be seen from uh, the footage that we have. And on the case, in the case of Charon, because Charon was the fairy keeper, or, or Charon was the fairy keeper, that would carry the lost souls across the sticks to the underworld, uh, these chasmata were named in honor of mythological or a fictional spacecraft. Now some of the names come from mythology, there's the Argo, Manjet, but there's also Macros Chasma, Tardis, Nostromo and Serenity. But the IAU being kind of boring, they have only approved the mythological stuff rather than the more recent fictional stuff, which is such a shame because I think Serenity Chasma is such a beautiful name. Come to think of it, perhaps I should just import the Serenity into Space Engine and fly through the, you know, Serenity Chasma in the Serenity. Similarly, we could fly through the Macross Chasma in, you know, fighter jets. I'm not sure about Tardises because they just kind of, you know, appear. And the Nostromo does not seem like the kind of thing to be flying through Beggar's Canyon back home at any speed at all. Now, I just have to make through with my engineered Imperial Eagle. It has uh, the enhanced drives with the dirty drives upgrade. So I haven't stripped everything down, but I've removed things like shields that might protect my spacecraft. Yeah. Anyway, look, we are just here because New Horizons made a visit, but we are going to go further afield. So while Pluto is out on the edge of our solar system, there is one more target that New Horizons will pass. That is going to be 2014 MU69, which is a small Kuiper Belt object. It has now been rechristened to Ultima Thule, which is supposed to say it's the ultimate point on the edge of the solar system. And there will not be any other spacecraft flying by bodies that far out. But... The spacecraft themselves, they will continue going long after the mission has stopped and their radiothermal isotope generators have shut down. If you travel out to the very edge of the solar system in Elite Dangerous, you can come across an ancient probe. There's actually three of them, very hard to find because you have to get within about a, a couple of AU, and these are weeks, light weeks out, 23 million, 2.3 million light seconds, but there it is. Voyager 1. Voyager 1 is, of course, the spacecraft which is furthest from the sun, the human-created object that has, was the first to leave the solar system and cross the heliopause. And it carried with it a record. And, of course, you can turn up the sound and hear the messages. Hello, 
сърдечни поздрави на всички, които намерят това съобщение. Салутарила ностре калдуруа се тутурор челор каре ауда чез месаж. Ек вин шлюте ин флинлек венце ан алмо ват ири бутскап тиекум. Их зенде хирмет ди бестен вунче ан алле емфенга диза нахрихт. The Golden Records were, of course, intended to be artifacts that might be discovered by an alien species, presumably one with a great deal of technology, since finding something this small in interstellar space would be quite difficult, to say the least. But it contained greetings from all over the world in many languages, it contained music, and it contained pictures. While the discs resembled regular records, they rotated only at 16 and two-thirds RPM. And apparently the whole project came together inside something like six weeks from conception to final delivery. Anyway, I'm way out on the edge of the solar system, so to get back to the sun, it's actually a lot faster for me to jump around in hyperspace. It takes about 37 minutes to fly out to where Voyager 1 is, uh, in Elite obviously. It takes a little longer if you're flying at the speed of Voyager 1, like a thousand years. You can also find Voyager 2 and you can find the New Horizons spacecraft. Not easy to find, but it's very cool. Anyway, I've returned to the inner solar system. and. Anyway, we're still on this theme of NASA-related stuff. Obviously, jumped in very close to the sun. In fact, closer than Parker Solar Probe will go. It's uh, fast, but I'm traveling you know, faster than the speed of light, thanks to the frameshift drive. No, I'm going to head back to Earth and to the moon. And there are a number of space stations around the Earth and the moon, but in particular, there is Galileo, which is uh, it's the gateway station. The Lunar Orbital Gateway sitting in orbit around the moon and being a place for, you know, hustlers and wanderers and scoundrels. Wait, nope, that's Babylon 5. Um, no, it's just a space station in orbit all alone in the night. And yeah, NASA right now is pitching the concept of the Lunar Orbiting Platform Gateway, LOPG. Not the greatest acronym that they've ever come up with. Galileo. Well, it's a little bigger than the LOPG concept. In fact, the LOPG concept is going to be smaller than the International Space Station. Whereas the station here, Galileo, is several kilometers across, you know, maybe 10 kilometers long. It is an absolute huge, monstrous entity that could only exist in a video game. The real world design will be made of maybe four or five modules that will be carried out on the SLS and it will not be permanently inhabited. It will be something where the astronauts might live for a month or so while they're coordinating with perhaps teams on the ground. So it's supposed to serve as a gateway to get you, give you a place to stay where you're landing on the moon or perhaps a stop off point when you're heading on the way to Mars. Of course, turns out that the math doesn't really work so well because whatever you do, you're paying a Delta V penalty to stop at this you know, installation. So there are some, like Robert Zubrin, who refer to it as the Lunar Toll Booth because the toll you're paying is your Delta V. And you know, I'm definitely in agreement with, uh, with him that, there, you know, we should be really doing things that are actually useful rather than things that are designed to keep people in jobs and all that. Obviously SLS is an amazing rocket, but it's also a very expensive and overpriced rocket. Meanwhile, I have my amazing looking Imperial uh, Eagle. Imperial Eagle, yeah, built for speed and looking very sexy inside this lunar space station. I'm pretty sure the original Galileo never had a close encounter with a bird as sexy as this. Okay, that's pretty crude, but I, I thought it was kind of funny. Anyway, look, uh, we're going to head out back into space to see some more stuff where Elite crosses the crosses the pathways of uh, NASA's research. Now, NASA, of course, has sent space probes all over the solar system to every major planet and a couple of uh, dwarf planets and asteroids and everything. But, uh, yeah, one of the recent ones which spent a very long time around an outer planet was Cassini. 
It spent oh, like two decades or something, I don't know, it spent a really long time orbiting around Saturn, looking at all its moons and spending... So yeah, we are looking for a target out there, we are looking for a space station around Saturn. And we have uh, somewhere down here. Where is it? Where is it? Where is the damn thing? It's it's obviously, obviously NASA's astro navigation people. They they figure out these things before they launch. After all, traveling through the solar system isn't like dusting crops, boy. Without precise navigation, uh, you might end up flying too close to a planet, and that might end your trip real quick. Yeah, I'm just winging it here, heading towards Titan City. Titan, of course, is one of the largest moons in the solar system, even larger if you include its absolutely massive atmosphere. It has a very dense nitrogen atmosphere, uh, which is also heavily saturated with all sorts of organic compounds. So yes, in the Elite Universe, a thousand years ago, Cassini ended its mission around Saturn. But for me, it seems like it was just last year. We get to see the rings here, we can see some of the moons. There's Enceladus, Titan City. Enceladus, you have to be careful not to say Enceladus, otherwise it sounds like you're talking about enchiladas, which are very tasty, but they do not generally play host to a large subsurface ocean, which is uh, melted by thermal vents, uh, where, you know, life could actually potentially form, live, exist, thrive, and therefore makes it a very interesting place for astronomers in the outer solar system, along with uh, some other ice moons. Just gonna fly past this. You can actually land on Enceladus. Enceladus. Oh wait, I did the Enceladus thing. In Elite, and you can in fact find evidence of the liquid water under its surface. There are vents to be found, and we will take a look at some of those, or at least not on Enceladus. We'll take a look at some vents. So yeah, Titan, largest moon in the solar system, is surrounded by a very thick atmosphere. There has been one spacecraft which actually landed on it, and that was Huygens. It was carried there by the Cassini spacecraft, and uh, while Huygens parachuted into the atmosphere, getting a great close-up of the surface using its 40 kilopixel camera and other instrumentation, Cassini flew by and collected the data, re you know, relayed it back to Earth. Cassini then spent a decade or more zipping around the moons of, t of Saturn, getting a close look at everything there. And you know, Cassini is probably one of the last really big missions. It's even bigger than the flagship missions that would they talk about today at NASA. I think the only thing that would be comparable in NASA's potential future is the Europa Clipper, which is pretty much being set up in such a way that only the SLS can carry it into space. And I really would love to see that mission go, to be able to land, fly to Europa and land something on it. In the Elite Universe, with the power of frameshift drive, we can obviously get there in a few minutes. And then when we get there, there's a giant space station full of hmm, all sorts of fun things here. The reason I'm going here is I want to swap out my awesome I Imperial Eagle and replace it with an ASP Explorer, which is a much more long-range spacecraft. I have the the Eagle set up for speed, for flying through canyons like we did back home in Bullseye and Womp Rats. The ASP on the other hand has a giant cockpit that lets me see everything and has a hyperspace system, a frameshift drive that will let me jump 50 plus light years. But in this case, we aren't going nearly so far. But in this case, we're not going out far. In fact, we're going back in towards the sun, towards the planet Jupiter, the largest planet in the solar system. And around it, we have the moon Europa, as I've mentioned. The reason I switched over to the Asp Explorer, as well as the beautiful cockpit that lets me see everything, is that this spacecraft carries a rover inside it. So we will be able to get down on the surface of Europa and do some surface investigation. Now while this looks like a simple glass cockpit letting me gaze out into space, it actually incorporates all sorts of fantastic sensors that let me see things I otherwise wouldn't. So I, I could see the rings of Jupiter there despite them being much fainter than you would otherwise, uh, than they, you know, would be su suggested by these uh, graphics here. But yeah, we are headed towards Europa and we want to investigate the ice geysers, the, or the ice geysers, depending upon how you pronounce these things. 
Now these ice geysers are an example of what's called cryovolcanism. Out at the distance of Jupiter, ice, you know, water ice is essentially frozen solid as rock. So, you know, when it gets hot, it melts into water and you can get uh, volcanic activity, but it's volcanic activity at temperatures which are much lower than we would experience on Earth. And we see this throughout the outer solar system. We, it was originally seen on Triton, a moon around Neptune. And uh, yeah, it's obviously around Enceladus, it's on Europa. And there's actually evidence of cryovolcanic activity on Ceres, which isn't even a full-size planet. It's a dwarf planet, probably the smallest candidate yet. The Dawn spacecraft is currently in orbit around the uh, planet, the dwarf planet of Ceres, and I think its mission is soon to come to an end as it is running out of fuel. I, on the other hand, I'm not running out of fuel, but I am running out of a place to land this thing. There we go, got it down nicely. Now, let's chill for a moment and appreciate the beauty of where we are. There's Jupiter in the background, the plumes, the sun is must be just below the horizon, so we are seeing reflected sunlight just passing through the edge here. Very nice. Okay, let's go out for a drive. As I said, this spacecraft comes with a hangar for a surface roving vehicle. Unfold it and we shall go and take a closer look at these little geysers, or geysers. I, I've always said geysers, but uh, geysers is probably far more correct. But having said that, if they want to call it geysers, why don't they use a U instead of an E? There we go, look, you can actually see the liquid water, which is probably condensing or solidifying to uh, you know, so it should be solidifying right away into ice. Now, in the real world, these plumes shoot hundreds of kilometers high. In this case, they're going a little more slowly. But, unlike the real world, these plumes are actually much more powerful. In Elite Dangerous, you can, of course, play tourist and go and visit these locations just to appreciate their natural beauty. Or, there is also where they spawn rare materials, rare, uh, you know, rare ice types form, where you can pick up minerals and materials that you can use for uh, engineering your spacecraft. Or, you can drive into the plumes and get ejected high above the surface, which is kind of fun, to be honest. Obviously, you want to carry around some materials to repair your spacecraft, but... Yeah, you can't do that in the real world, I don't think. They're not that powerful. I don't think NASA is considering using one of these plumes to shoot the spacecraft back into orbit. But let's actually put that faster-than-light capability to use. Using hyperdrive, I can jump to any of the nearby stars. Elite Dangerous made a point of trying to copy as much of the real galaxy as possible. You can see many well-known stars here, like Procyon, uh, you can also see some less well-known things like 61 Cygni, Ross 154, uh, etc. What they've done is they've taken real star catalogs and integrated them into their universe. But it goes beyond that. As you pull further and further back, you can start to see nebula. You can start to see things like the California Nebula. You can see Polaris, which is thousands of light years away. And going even further out, you start to see the structure of the galaxy itself. Now, obviously, every single star in this galaxy is not real data. We don't know the location of every single star, but the game fills in the gaps and lets you go anywhere within the Milky Way. And so we have a plan. Where could we go that would be NASA themed? Well, NASA has a mission called Kepler, which just is, is basically running out of fuel. It is about to shut down, but it discovered many, many exoplanets. And many of these exoplanets are in the catalogs, so Elite Dangerous integrated this data into the actual catalogs used in the game. So I can fly out to Kepler 42, and while it would normally take thousands and thousands of years to travel the hundred plus light years to Kepler 42, well, uh, we have of course video game hyperdrives that can cross the distance in a matter of seconds and drop us right out on top of this star. Now, in Elite Dangerous, the way you find planets is by using your solar system scanner, which makes that big honk sound. That will let me find the locations of all the objects nearby, but it doesn't give me 
any details on it, so they're unexplored. In real world, Kepler, what it did to find these objects was it had a telescope that looked at a portion of the sky continuously. And these objects, when they passed in front of the star, they made the brightness of the star drop by a tiny fraction, less than 1%. But that was enough that we, it was possible to actually find these because they would happen, the same 1% brightness drop would happen at the same time with regularity. Now at Kepler 42, these are all what are called hot Jupiters, hot gas giants that are very close to the star. That means their period is quite quick, it's measured in days or weeks. That meant that, meant that Kepler was able to not just see this brightness drop, but it was able to regularly confirm that it was there. And so it could see that there were at least three objects with different periods. Kepler pl was placed into deep space where it sat, pointed very carefully at exactly the same point in the sky continuously for years. Then it started losing bits of hardware and it was eventually reduced to two working reaction wheels. And reaction wheels are used by spacecraft to make sure that they point in the correct direction. With only two reaction wheels, they were in trouble. But the engineers behind the spacecraft came up with a solution whereby they could use the radiation pressure, the light from the sun, to balance the spacecraft and hold it in a stable configuration so that they were able to take the otherwise doomed Kepler mission and create the K2 mission, where it would focus at two different parts in the sky depending upon the time of year. And using the solar radiation pressure to control the roll, it could use the other two, um, the other two reaction wheels to control its yaw. And then the other thing it would need was reaction control thrusters to desaturate the reaction wheels over time. And while the reaction wheels are still operating, Kepler is basically out of fuel at this point, and the great planet discovery mission is at its end. At this point, NASA has launched a new spacecraft called TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey uh, Satellite. This is orbiting between the Earth and the Moon, and it is actually going to cover the entire sky. However, it's only going to be looking at these, these stars for a few weeks at a time, which means it's only really going to capture the hot Jupiters, things that have very short periods. It might get clues of other planets, but unless their periodicities exactly line up with the revisit times, it's not going to be the same mission. It will certainly find more planets than than uh, Kepler ever did. But uh, yeah, that is the end of our little tour. This is the little overview that I did. You can actually check the original version we did on NASA's Twitch channel or on their YouTube channel. And of course, Elite Dangerous has just launched it, the beta for its new update. And I will no doubt see many of you out there. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Yeah.